Okay. You can. that will give you, you know, certain perspectives on informal urbanism or on many. And then in the second half, um, today, um, we will present, <coughs> Hanna and I will present a little bit of the, um, why we chose Medellin and also the shifting ground research that we started. And I hope you can time to take a look at the document. And in the second half today, we also uh, will talk a little bit about your research topics and what happens in the next, next week when Alejandro is here. <coughs> um, so, but the first, first one and a half hours are basically, the first half of the hours are dedicated to uh, our visitor. Uh, invi I invited Robert Calvert, who is an associate professor at the Victor and I met Robert first about probably four years ago, where yeah, they organized a conference about informal cities, and he invited actually Alejandro Echeverri to that conference. And this is the first time I heard Alejandro talk about his work, so um, I'm really excited that Robert is the first one to do a talk in this class because some sense his conference started my engagement with me. So I'm grateful for that. And uh, Robert has similar interests than I. He's an architect. And of course, he just talked before a little bit. He operates between architecture and design and planning. So he kind of is strategically located there. And that's also a very good spot to be in when you work with uh, informal urbanism. Where you have to be, have to have an approach that's multi scalar, where you come from a larger scale down to the small scale and back. So that's, that's something that's really a, uh, an asset if you do that. Um, I talked to Robert about the potential topic he wants to talk about, and he said he, because he's very familiar with me, he's done the research there, he has traveled quite a bit there, um, <coughs> and so he wanted to talk say, more about a methodology, how to, as a designer, how to approach informal urbanism. And he has worked on that for a while now. And I told him, okay, you have 20 to 30 minutes. I said, wow, that's really short for what I'm basically thinking of. So I granted him a little bit more time, like 40 minutes, but we won't hold him accountable. Um, but. Robert will basically present his theory, and then we should have ample time to have a discussion with him. Um, I told Robert that you don't know yet too much about Medi, but you already started a little bit of engaging the topic of informal urbanism. So thank you very much for coming, and please welcome Robert Cumbert. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that, is there a way to um, dim the light? Uh, Yes. yes, thanks. So I'm, I'm very uh, flattered and gratified to have this chance to speak with people who share my interests in Medellin. Uh, I don't often get a chance at my own uh, institution to, uh, to engage on too many, uh, with too many people on this topic, so um, I'm always looking for an opportunity. and. Um, <clears throat> My presentation um, presumes either that you already know a lot about Medellin or that um, before you go into knowing a lot, uh, it's useful to uh, establish or at least have in mind a framework for the uh, exploration. And so this is more about the framework of exploring Medellin than uh, the actual details of Medellin or the results of an investigation of Medellin. Um, 
because this framework emerges out of my own initial investigations of Medellin, um, they are to a large extent a product of what is there on the ground right now. Uh, so these, this framework does in part emerge out of the actual conditions in Medellin, but they also emerge out of my own experience and probably more uh, explicitly out of um, the larger framings of history and theory of architecture and the design professions generally. So um, as I start out on this presentation, it's going to seem impossibly grandiose and global, <clears throat> but I hope uh, we can quickly establish that framework as the basis for moving in and looking at um, what you will be doing, uh, which will be very detailed, hopefully. Um, so with that preamble, um, I'm calling this presentation Reflex City, Medellin's Second Modernity. Now there are two key terms, oh, spelled wrong, sorry about that. Um, two key terms here, one is reflex. And reflex is a very commonplace term that we know what that means. Um, but the way, uh, what I'm proposing uh, as a framework here revolves around a word related to the word reflex, which is the word reflexivity. And the word reflexivity uh, refers to an attribute of a system behavior that when there is, when something happens, there is a response. There is a, in some form in, within the system, a response. And so it, it is the, um, the idea that there is a responsive relationship between conditions and uh, a design response, or better yet, that the design, the process of design produces a framework within which uh, there is a responsiveness to the system. Uh, and this hopefully will become clearer as I contrast it to um, its opposite, which is a, re a structural rigidity to systems, which I am going to present as one of the key characteristics of 20th century modernism. <clears throat> uh, and reflexivity uh, in this talk becomes the key attribute of what some people have postulated as being worthy of characterization as a second phase of modernity. And so that's where the term second modernity comes in. So reflexivity as a system attribute and second modernity as a useful way of, of thinking of the 21st century, especially from a design perspective. <coughs> and um, I welcome interruptions in the course of this uh, as we move along, um, especially if something's not clear. So, so as in all uh, histories, we start not from the beginning, but from the present. And the present perspective is what informs all of our histories, and every generation rewrites history from the perspective of the present. And so I take this example from last week um, out in the blogosphere, uh, a lot of chatter about uh, the upcoming 2012 Venice Biennale, um, the design gathering. Uh, there's a showcase for the state of design globally, very important. Uh, annual event, biannual event. Um, and the theme for the 2012 Biennale is uh, this, what you see here in the American Pavilion um, promotion here, the design actions for the common good. And this is increasingly uh, a visible direction that design culture is taking that instead of, um, as many people feel, designers talking to designers about design in a language that is inaccessible to the rest of the world, that, um, that that's a lot of fun and it actually, I would say, it does produce a great deal of useful uh, research results. But uh, its usefulness seems to be limited in many people's minds to the laboratory itself. And so you have extensive laboratory research going on that results in further laboratory research, 
and none of it ever leaves the laboratory. Not even the language uh, that is used in the laboratory, which is the ac academy to a large extent, uh, is the language is inaccessible to those outside of the academy. And so uh, design professions and architecture in particular have been subjected to uh, criti criticism that we are beside the point uh, and not only um, not helping the world, but actually doing visible harm. And we'll get into the context of that in a moment. Um, and so uh, we see increasingly an attempt to bring the results of the design research, which I claim is extremely valuable, to bring it outside of the laboratory, out of the Petri dish, and into real soil of the earth. And uh, I think the interest of design professions in informal settlements is one of the hopeful uh, signs that this is happening in a productive way. There's also, I mean, many of you could list other examples. The, um, uh, the exhibition in the United Nations uh, last year, I, I think it's still there, um, at the Cooper Hewitt about design for the other 90%, uh, which is the second installment of this same thing. But uh, I won't dwell on the other examples, just one of several dozen examples from very recent news. Um, this emerges out of something I published in 2009 um, called Notes on Post-Criticality Towards an Architecture of Reflexive Modernization. And just to summarize the argument in that, um, it points out that um, just as Charles Jenks used this kind of a trite device to say modernism died uh, at this time in the afternoon on this date and at, at this moment at the implosion of um, Pruitt Igo. Um, similarly, the um, uh, that there's this kind of planned obsolescence uh, instinct that architecture has adopted from capitalism that. Uh, and you look at Patrick Schumacher's declaration of the death of modernism being replaced by something he calls parametricism, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, but Charles Jenks says modernism's over, now it's postmodernism, and that is increasingly not a, not a useful frame of reference to refer to, and so many of us don't even teach it in our history courses anymore. And there's been this new thing called criticality, post-criticality, which I claim in this piece published in 2009 is similarly uh, distracting, that there was this thing called critical architecture that uh, was critical of capitalism's um, uh, influences on architecture and the need to uh, disengage and resist capitalism that resulted in this uh, very rich period of architectural research, but also came with uh, undesirable consequences of disengaging architecture as a profession from the problems of the real world. And so the critical backlash of critical theory is to reject all theory. And so we have uh, Terry Eagleton, one of the four founding fathers of critical uh, theory, uh, denouncing his own movement. To, and then Michael Speaks writing it for Architectural Record encourages uh, schools around North America, especially in the Northeast, to give up this history theory thing and just get back to um, projects. And so the post-critical backlash to the critical uh, uh, came in full swing um, in the past decade. Um, but basically, I, um, in my 2009 piece, claimed that this is also an unnecessary distraction that takes away from the real point um, that um, is best grounded in the in a historical framing that comes out of um, sociology. And so this is the framework that I am proposing as being the most useful framework for understanding a lot of things going on in the 21st century uh, and in general, and uh, informal settlements and Medellin's very specifically. Um, the thesis of these gentlemen uh, who discovered each other, 
they discovered that they were each tapping into the same idea, but interpreting it in different ways. And the resonance of their work inspired them in 1994 to uh, work to collaborate on this publication, which is basically taking three of their essays and binding it under one cover. So they don't even agree on the same terms of reference, but this is part of what makes this so rich, is you have three independent explorations of an idea that seems to be emerging. And the idea goes something like this, and I'm going to be using the terms of reference uh, by Ulrich Beck, uh, who came here last year um, and talked about a lot of things, but not this, um, uh, until I engaged him over dinner. Um, he, he seems to have moved uh, beyond these terms of reference, but I argue uh, with him uh, that this is the big game in town. Um, and so, in a way, he's passed the baton, um, hopefully on to designers uh, to figure this out. But it goes something like this. Ulrich Beck is famous for coining the term risk society, which increasingly characterizes the conditions we, as a profession or multiple professions, are engaging in. That um, there are uh, serious challenges uh, that are the result of the solutions of the 20th century. Uh, the utopian modernism of the 20th century uh, succeeded so tremendously uh, that it yielded great breakthroughs, but it also yielded uh, unintended consequences. And for most of the 20th century, as these unintended consequences became more and more significant, the approach was uh, characterized by the technological fix or further um, big uh, breakthroughs. Uh, so all the problems that were created by modernism would be solved by a similar modernism. And um, that there are many, there's a lot of examples and evidence that that to a certain extent is true, but there are several examples that would argue, would demonstrate, or would indicate that um, no more of the same thing continues to create uh, insurmountable challenges. Um, exhibit A is uh, global warming, um, where, yes, maybe floating reflective items out in orbit might reduce the, the, the pace of overheating the globe, but it might also cause other problems that we can't anticipate. And so um, the reflexive, the use of reflexive in this title refers, is, a, is an implied critique of 20th century modernism is in that it is not reflexive. It is non-responsive. It is rigid and uh, characterized by uh, inflexibility. Utopian visions by their very nature um, are slow to change. And when problems arise, the typical response from designers is something to the effect of, well, it's, we haven't fully implemented our utopian vision yet, so give us a chance. Give us control of the landscape and the world, and we will deliver on our promises. You just have to give us the problem. The reason these problems are coming up is you have not yet given us total control. Um, and this is echoed in a critique by James C. Scott, Seen Like a State, and his other books, um, which is a vivid uh, critique of 20th century modernism in many ways. Maybe you've heard of Scott. It's, he's, his argument has become quite popular in, in design schools. Um, but the, at one point in the early days of modernism, um, architecture was a vehicle for delivering uh, the benefits of technological and political revolution to the largest number of people. It was very much up front in um, the discourse around moder early modern movements of uh, the 20s and before that the, uh, that the world was transforming, was in the midst of transformation, and it was opening a new era for humanity where democratic institutions would spread um, 
power and uh, democracy to populations previously um, without access to these things, education, health care, medicine, uh, and general well-being from this technological industrial revolution that wouldn't just create benefits for the wealthiest in society, but spread them to the global majority. And this was very much the mission of the early modern movements. Uh, something happened after World War II uh, where this was transformed, and we get what uh, James C. Scott distinguishes uh, from the larger goals of modernism. He calls, he makes the distinction uh, labeling it high modernism. And if one um, embraces that uh, critique, then what we emerge from that is that the reaction in the 70s and 80s to the excesses of, of modernism is really a reaction against high modernism. And so postmodernism is perhaps a reaction against, or better understood as post-high modernism. But the larger trajectory of modernity as a phenomenon uh, continues uh, and continues in very significant ways uh, and, in, and this is in part uh, behind the uh, fading away of postmodernism as a relevant uh, framework of, of understanding things. And so um, from our current perspective we look back and uh, things like uh, Buckminster Fuller and a lot of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s start to take on uh, greater relevance to the design world. And this is an image from Bruce Mao, uh, Massive Change, the exhibition and book, that design is a key consideration in that far from being simply a small department uh, in the marketing area of many corporations, it's really the big circle. It's the approach to problem solving that uh, is capable of integrating the insights of multiple perspectives, multiple different uh, expertise. Uh, all comes together uh, in design. And <clears throat> this distinguishes it from the prevalent approaches of the 20th century, where um, the professions splintered off into ever narrowing considerations um, of technical problem solving. And so the problem of uh, transportation would be solved by a highway engineer and cut a highway through our cities. And, um, and because the problem was narrowly defined as getting as many people as possible with the highest degree of freedom within a capitalist system from point A to point B. Now, um, there were many secondary side effects uh, that can be listed and are listed um, in courses in this building um, that all end up at uh, global warming somehow. And design is the solution to this point of view, this approach to problem solving by taking multiple considerations from multiple points of view and integrating them in a more holistic way. And this brings us to the Netherlands um, where uh, arguably, um, since the first floods in the ninth century, uh, the extreme hardship imposed by high population density and low elevation in the Netherlands has uh, required this population and this society to deal with constant threat of uh, crisis and disaster, natural and man-made disaster, resulting in a mindset of collective decision making characterized by the water boards that had to organize uh, across the landscape locally and in larger systems how to prevent flooding uh, of their fields. And this stands in stark contrast to the mindset of North America where uh, a sense of unlimited resources, in particular land, has led to a distinctive uh, approach that uh, is based on the presumption of excess and abundance and endless supply uh, with serious consequences. 
Um, and so in the Dutch landscape, the, the, um, the population gathered around uh, urban centers in a way of, as a strategy for preserving agricultural land. And so over the decades, the centuries and decades, even to the uh, present, you get uh, high concentrations of population um, and uh, preservation of the farmland only partially um, uh, weakened lately through uh, the adoption of American-style governance of land use. Um, but uh, the Dutch approach uh, is also characterized by the necessity of not just talking about things, but of demonstrating, uh, demonstrating phenomena, uh, which I refer to as Missouri rules. Um, Missouri is the show me state. And this is a kind of a counter theoretical. Instead of just developing theories and talking about things, uh, you should demonstrate them. And so famously in 1995, when the Dutch government uh, announced that in order to satisfy the housing needs of the growing Netherlands, um, they would need to build 800,000 housing units. And uh, at the time, as they were uh, warming up to American land use uh, governance uh, mechanisms, uh, free market mechanisms of land use, um, uh, this was an exhibition um, in Rotterdam by West 8. Adrian Choyza comes here quite a bit, I believe. Um, what do 800,000 housing units look like if they are done in the North American tradition of single-family housing? And this was a demonstration, a visceral de demonstration, that the quality of the architecture might not matter because of, or it might get lost in the sheer volume of housing. And so this is a demonstration of what 800,000 houses might look like. Um, and so it was a very, it was, it was a very effective uh, critique of uh, design approaches and governance. Uh, but it also characterized um, um, Dutch approaches to design engagement uh, for the next several decades, uh, which has also incorporated computer technology um, and also opened up the discourse to other factors. And here you see this is a, a computer game, a video game, basically, uh, to replace rigid planning approaches. That instead of planners producing a document that says, in, in 50 years, this is what the world should look like, or our piece of the world should look like, instead, um, MVRDV uh, collaborated with computer scientists to develop uh, gaming software to play out uh, extreme scenarios and uh, that reflects more the dynamic quality of you do one thing, you make one intervention into the landscape, and other things happen that might be unpredictable. And so it's a more of a, <clears throat> it's a more resilient, flexible means of modeling that are facilitated by computers that has since become uh, a very rich uh, area of design uh, intervention uh, and data collection <clears throat> whereby uh, by keeping track of the location of cell phones uh, one can actually map phenomena that on the fly dynamically in real time that were previously uh, unex inaccessible and so here you see um, Singapore mapped in terms of cell phone activity at, at certain times. Uh, this is done through MIT in collaboration with Singapore. Um, and another characteristic uh, that is emerging, um, so I should um, clarify that I'm trying to show examples that are suggestive of the kind of approaches that might characterize a reflexive uh, design approach of second modernity in contrast to 20th century more rigid uh, utopian uh, design approaches. Uh, and the hope is that by becoming sensitive to these attributes of design approaches, 
both coming out of the professional world of designers, but also elsewhere. Um, we can uh, start to uh, enrich our tool set uh, for design in ways that make design as effective as it needs to be to uh, more seriously uh, contribute to, the cha to facing the challenges of the 21st century. And so the, um, so from the, the Dutch approach of, uh, it emerges out of extreme necessity of sheer survival um, to the kinds of approaches that are facilitated by computer software and ubiquitous data collection uh, from satellites to cell phones to uh, all of these social media and the invasion of privacy that is possible and facilitated by computers that this is data collection uh, and redeployment and visualization uh, that helps us both uh, to analyze phenomena in a way that we previously were not able to, but also engage uh, with uh, problem solving in a way that was also previously unavailable to us. Um, so from the Dutch disaster landscape approaches to computational tools, um, we turn now to uh, something more familiar uh, and that's been around for quite a while, which is what designers do. Um, and here's uh, an image of a, a residential tower, quite interesting design-wise, um, this dynamic form um, with pools on each balcony. Um, quite appealing, something that might even get great kudos in the design literature. But here's its context, uh, which is um, in the midst of the informal settlements of uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Parasopolis. You've yeah, been there. Right? Yeah. Um, so basically, this is not, in, in many ways, this is a conflictual relationship. But in other ways, if you look at it from an economic and land use point of view, this is actually a symbiotic relationship. And if you look at it from uh, the functioning of a city, it is also a symbiotic relationship in that um, informal settlements provide housing uh, that uh, formal um, governments and market <laughs> forces uh, in the formal sector are incapable of providing. And so informal settlements is a resilient, dynamic, uh, spontaneous, uh, resourceful response to demand uh, that makes up for the inadequacies of formal arrangements, both of state governments and market-driven economies. And they provide housing not just for um, criminals, uh, which is kind of the, um, the stereotype uh, that prevails in much of the world, but um, also workers, uh, including government workers. As a matter of fact, I know government workers in Indonesia working in the offices to obliterate informal settlements uh, who live themselves in informal settlements. Um, and the workers in the people who clean the pool and uh, maintain the tennis courts and the grounds and clean the houses uh, all live uh, on the other side of this uh, barricade um, guarded by armed guards. The guards themselves live on the left side of the barricade. So it's um, symbi it's a symbiotic relationship in terms of housing supply for a workforce uh, that supports everything that happens on the right side of the barricade. It's also a symbiotic relationship in terms of land development that the reason that the luxury residential tower on the right could be built is because it was quite easy to dislocate the settlers who lived on that land um, very quickly. They didn't have to approach uh, formal landowners, uh, the 138 parcels, uh, and negotiate a purchase from every single one of them. They could simply expropriate um, the squatters uh, because the land was illegally settled. And so um, the informal settlements provide a land bank that makes these larger luxury developments possible, uh, just in terms of a land uh, consolidation point of view. And so it's a fairly complex arrangement. 
Um, and the physical attribute of this landscape that's probably most striking is the wall itself. Um, and so, um, but there are other, and this slide isn't very clear, but this is Dharavi in India, the formal infrastructure development of water supply to the formal city becomes a uh, walkway uh, for the residents of the informal settlement. Uh, and they walk on top of this pipeline um, in order to get um, electricity in the informal settlements, um, young men risk their lives to tap into the formal electrical grid. Uh, same is true for cable TV, um, water supply, you name it, uh, the infrastructure is available. Okay, which brings us to Medellin, finally. Um, Sergio Fajardo, uh, you've probably been introduced to this character already, um, but he was not the first one to uh, come up with any of these ideas in Medellin. He simply um, was successful in deploying them uh, in a big way. Um, the architects and planners had been working for decades prior to um, Sergio Fajardo's election uh, to mayor of Medellin in 2003. Um, he started his term in 2004. Yeah. And, uh, he simply deployed the plans that had been under development for several decades. Uh, his father was a, a well-known architect, and, um, and so he grew up in a circle of the design community in Medellin, and he simply deployed these ideas um, very dramatically. His primary challenge was to um, make good and follow through on a phenomena that had already, uh, was already well underway. Um, you've, you've looked at the murder rate um, peaking in the early 90s and descending for all the reasons it descended because of the success in the drug wars. Um, but because of the success in the drug wars, Medellin was about to be or was in the process of being uh, flooded with uh, former guerrillas uh, who left Medellin when they were 14 and uneducated. Uh, they were handed uh, an AK-47, and they grew up for the next 20 years um, as professional soldiers in the drug wars. They were being sent back to Medellin with no skills, no education, except on how to shoot. And they came back with their guns. And so as this population of uneducated 30-somethings um, who were very good at shooting and had no means of income, as they came back to Medellin, the challenge was to give them something to do other than um, a life of crime. And so um, the campaign was to make Medellin the most educated city in the world, um, or in, in Colombia, to give these young men an alternative to crime. And so here you see the... Um, I don't know why the words aren't showing up, but um, basically you get the idea. Medellin is the dotted red line. Uh, uh, many cities in Colombia benefited greatly from the reduction of the drug trafficking in the cities, <clears throat> but Medellin uh, made the most of it um, by reducing the murder rate even more dramatically than the other cities of Colombia by mobilizing these education campaigns um, that would lead to paid work. And so um, the, the primary drive was education, but um, they needed a convincing way, sorry, this didn't turn out, they needed a convincing way to demonstrate that they were serious. And so they turned to design uh, and construction. And you know much of this story where they, instead of um, designing world-class uh, facilities for the wealthiest, they would locate these uh, libraries and parks where the most crime had occurred. And so they were targeting, their target audience was not the privileged of Medellin, their target audience were the most deprived population. And so um, the, just, you probably have seen this bridge. Um, Maybe briefly. Uh, briefly, well here it is both brief and small. Um, two warring neighborhoods uh, had a history of uh, sharks and jets kind of uh, uh, 
turf warfare and assassination. And so the response was to design and build a bridge between the two neighborhoods um, in a collaborative method uh, that brought the two communities together, not so they could be more effective in their uh, mutual annihilation, but so they could develop social ties. And so this is an example of a piece of physical infrastructure and design that actually very directly serves as an instrument of making things better. Uh, the transportation network is a similarly <coughs> clear, direct instrument of simply giving the people in the informal settlements on the steep hillsides access to the economy and social opportunities of the rest of the city. Uh, so it's a rights to the city kind of uh, gesture, very direct, uh, common sense way to give people access to all the benefits of uh, urban urbanization. Um, when Fajardo came to Boston, he gave a very impassioned presentation about the design not being the most important thing. Design is a means to an end. It's a vehicle. And first and foremost, it's a vehicle for convincing people and demonstrating in the spirit of the demonstration effects, uh, as mentioned, the Dutch and the Missouri rules approach, um, to demonstrate to the people that this was not just talk. This wasn't just some government uh, program <coughs> with no physical transformative effects. Uh, he used architecture and infrastructure design and development as a very convincing vehicle for demonstrating uh, their commitment to transforming the city and the people's lives, the lives of as many people as possible. And I'm referring back to the original intention of the modern movements uh, prior to, uh, in the interwar period even, to spread the greatest benefits to the greatest number of people. Uh, and so this is very much in keeping with that early aspiration of the modern movements. Uh, but the question is, um, are the means by which this is done, is it a top-down uh, engagement in the same uh, approach as the 20th century? I mean, Fajardo is coming in, he's got four years as mayor, and then it's over. So the clock is ticking from the first moment of his, uh, of his uh, government. And he has to deliver on these promises in four years. He's got several hundred million dollars to do it, uh, which was basically given to him by the miraculous effect of simply making a commitment to not steal. By simply not stealing from uh, the government, so all of a sudden there was an extra several hundred million dollars to work with. And so uh, the budget was there simply by committing to not steal it. Uh, but they have to deploy it, and get it built in a convincing way within the four-year time period. So by definition, it absolutely has to be top-down driven in terms of its deployment. So the key question uh, in my research, and I don't know if uh, you will be hearing from Hota Samper from MIT. He will come, mm -hmm. but not give a separate lecture. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but Hota is from Medellin. He's doing a PhD at MIT. He is very much looking at the processes by which this, uh, these interventions are deployed, the participatory planning and design processes by which this, these things come about. One of the things that I find fascinating is in the King of Spain library, um, it, it exhibits all the characteristics of bad high modern architecture, yet it is effective nonetheless. I tell my students in the design studio, whatever you do, don't make hermetically sealed boxes. Don't create, don't create these uh, you know, voluptuous forms that are sealed capsules. Well, here we have voluptuous forms that are hermetically sealed capsules. Um, to its credit, there is a, the biggest thing that's being designed here is the space between the two spaceship capsules um, that very well um, defines a uh, public space. So um, a lot of the things, um, it, so it's too short to go into all the details of what it does wrong. 
Um, but somehow it still gets it right. And I go back to what Fajardo was saying, that this was a very much a very clear demonstration of the social commitment to bringing the greatest benefits to the largest number of people uh, and granting dignity um, where before there was only fear and uh, people hiding out in their houses for fear of stray bullets killing their children. And so the public space, despite the hermetically sealed quality of these uh, coffee cans, uh, the public space has been completely uh, reinvigorated. Uh, it's filled with people. This is their living room. And now it's more like the hill towns of Italy uh, than it is the slums of the developing world. I have slides from my honeymoon from the hill towns of Italy that look not so different from this. Um, and uh, attention has you know, become global. Um, it, and the transformations are downtown. They are in the different neighborhoods. You've probably seen these different uh, developments in Medellin. And the tourist boom, uh, it's one of the most popular tourist attractions, destinations in Latin America. These are pictures from the New York Times travel section. Uh, in 2007, I believe. Um, just like the Museum of Science, only better. A lot of it is outdoors. Uh, school groups uh, basically are constantly occupying these places. Now here's one of the library parks that I think exhibits the opposite of the King of Spain Library in that it's openness to the point where you can't even tell what's inside and what's outside. And the people have really adopted it as their living room um, even in the midst of the same old squatter settlement housing, uh, the self-constructed housing, it really is a vindication for those who have been saying for decades, um, stop with the housing already. The houses are fine. Focus on infrastructure, running water, um, sewage treatment, uh, managing, not sewage treatment, but managing sewage, uh, secure right, land rights, so they can actually invest in their own housing. And then um, focus on education and public facilities and public amenities that give them a sense of ownership and dignity. And so uh, the difference between Parasopolis, the um, very physical, clear demonstration of who's important and who is garbage uh, in Parasopolis is uh, countered by its opposite in Medellin where the absence of walls between the neighborhood and these fancy world-class architectural interventions uh, makes it clear that uh, these people have rights to the city. Um, and I'm referring to a lot of the literature recently about the rights to the city. It's a whole literature that is of, of interest probably to this course. Um, and. Um, this is my final slide. This is a project by one of my students uh, for Caracas. Um, the um, can't really see it, but she rendered it during a rainstorm. This is a, a piece of infrastructure that connects um, a mansion that was built before the informal settlements came in and is now owned by the city uh, and has been redesigned as a community cultural center for the benefit of the, of the neighborhood around it. But there is no way to get up there. There's basically a, a fortress cliff wall here. And um, Cheryl Bratzos designed uh, an elevator, stairway, library, water collection facility um, to connect, to provide a water source for the neighborhood and give them a physical connection up to the community center and extend it by including uh, library programs in it. So just um, uh, hopefully I'm provoking um, some questioning uh, in your, to inform your research as you move forward. Um, the, the key questions I would suggest you look at as you look at the evidence presented by Medellin is uh, whether or not this is uh, an example of the same old business as usual, top-down uh, design government interventions, or whether it's something else. And if it is something else, uh, 
how would you characterize this something else? And then really uh, the main question is to what extent uh, does the approach uh, in Medellin warrant or is even capable of translation so that it can be effectively deployed elsewhere? Uh, because we have a lot of challenges uh, in the 21st century um, that are to a large extent a result of the weaknesses of the approaches we deployed as a, a, the design professions in particular deployed in the 20th century. And so um, this research, I would argue, is very important to what we now turn our attention to doing and achieving in the 21st century. Thank you. That's, I'll stop there. Enough. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> Anybody wants to sit here because we want to talk a little bit? Um, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up right away to <laughs> Who, do you have any questions or comments? Or? I, I might start just with this question, the basic question. Like always, I see always this decline of homicides uh, in Medellin and in other uh, cities, and then you see these beautiful images of the libraries, of the cable, the cable trains, and so on. And it it always uh, gives this image that. If you bring in libraries and kindergarten and these cable cars, then everything will be fine. Homicides will go down, and design can solve all, all problems. I'm, I'm just provoking a little bit. Like, yeah, thank uh, you. Could you talk a little bit about, about the political background? Like, how do they clean up this uh, really dangerous neighborhoods before they could install all these things? Because I think it's it's not the design that is it's a symbol of of the change, mm -hmm. but it's not causing. As, as a main factor, this change. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, and I, the images are so deceiving. It's so easy because of our background to think, well, in the United States, with public housing, we tried to do this, but our design wasn't good, and so it failed. And that's the narrative all too often that's applied on our history, which is... Uh, just wrong, just cut to the chase. That's just plain wrong. Um, the main message I hope and I get out of this is it's not the design. It is everything but the design. But th for those things to work, the education and social programs and uh, all of this, for these things to be convincing, it sure is handy to have that clear demonstration of seriousness that design provides. So if it were just design, it would be an utter failure. Mm. Uh, if it were trying to do what it was doing without design, also some have suggested that it just would not have the teeth, it wouldn't have the credibility that is provided by these um, physical, undeniable physical transformations that, that are very convincing. Uh, so uh, one without the other is likely to result in failure. If you try to do the design part without everything else, it's uh, a, a joke. Um, and so it's very important to not, for the design professions not to look at examples like Medellin mm. and fall into this trap of saying, ah, Corbusier was right. You change the design and revolution uh, is averted and social benefits will flow out of the design. No. The early moderns, you know, in the 20s, um, the other modern movements prior to Siam were clear. This was a revolution that was happening first and foremost in every place but design. But design had a significant uh, opportunity to play a significant role in accelerating it and spreading it and catalyzing it. But without, you know, it is a revolution that design has a role in, but it's not about design. It's about the revolution. And I think uh, my reading is it resonates here. Now, your question about um, 
did design do this? No, of course not. Uh, the um, and this is one of my key questions. And I asked Fajardo, and I never got really a satisfactory answer myself um, as to what kind of deals were made with the military and with the drug cartels. What kind of negotiations resulted in what was basically um, a relocation of the drug? Uh, cartels out of the urban centers. Uh, uh, part of it was the government had a very strong negotiating position because of their military victories over the drug cartels. Um, so you notice not much of this has anything to do with design. It's just really design came in and Fajardo came in and these programs came in as a way to make the most out of these um, changes that were occurring on a military level. You know, the, the battlefield moved. So how do you uh, seize the opportunity presented by the relocation of the violence outside of the cities? Uh, and every city benefited, but Medellin benefited more. And Bogota also has been doing tremendous things. In a way, the whole Medellin thing um, is learning from the lessons in Bogota that happened before. But it's a smaller city, and... In a way, these examples are much more vivid than Bogota's even. I don't know if that helps at all. Sure. Well, the example you showed of, of uh, Charles Shanks uh, commenting on the implosion of the public housing, I think, was that Louisiana or? No, yeah, St. Louis. St. Louis, St. Louis. Yeah. There was a piece in the New York Times only last week um, comparing mm -hmm. the same uh, public housing in New York that's quite successful, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. I, was, I could have shown that as my first example, but then Venice Biennale came in, but there's a new movie on Pruitt Igo, and instead of the story uh, that we've been telling for decades that housing, the design killed public housing in the United States, uh, the evidence that that is not true has been available uh, since, you know, it all happened, that there are many, many public housing uh, developments globally, especially in Singapore and in Northern Europe, that are hugely successful. It's not all uh, the, the uh, slub, slum suburbs outside Paris and Pruitt Igo, even in the United States, there are very successful public housing examples. And I, think, I think that's touching on an interesting discussion that one can talk about the limits of design, at the same time the embeddedness of design in an orchestrated event. Yeah, when, when Fajardo explains Medellin, he always says uh, every time you take away, let's say, a uh, social problem like crime, you know, you, you uh, put a drug lord into prison, you have to come with a social opportunity. And first, um, you know, there have to be the teachers behind the curriculums to be made before it can happen in the shell of a building. And um, Alejandro, when he comes from, will say the same, that mm -hmm. the Design is just the receptacle of the ideas and programs and social programs that have to be orchestrated. The Spanish library, there are, when I was there, there were so many people in there at the end. We, I asked Fajardo, uh, Alejandro, so how many, how big is the staff? How many teachers? How many librarians? How many social workers? How many guards? How many people at the reception? There are probably 80 people who are employed in the Spanish library. So it's that's the cost of the building is a fraction of the running costs of these elements. And that's that's how I came to understand that it has to be a large orchestrated event. And I totally agree with you that just, if you ever hear these lectures of, uh, sometimes in very short lectures, designers tend to, yes, we built this beautiful building and then crime rate went down 30% in the area. It's not. It's, it's part of it, but it's not the reason for it. And we have these examples of Favela Bairro in Rio de Janeiro, where you know there was uh, upgrading programs done in common areas. Um, there were schools built, uh, there were sports grounds built, uh, playgrounds. And 10 years later, when you come back to it, they are deserted because you know crime and uh, drug lords are ruling the favela, and basically people are afraid to let their children outside. I mean, you can't build the nicest playground if people don't let their children outside because they are afraid to get hit by a stray bullet. It's th that there is an end to what design can do. I mean, that's
that's that's that's mm. a very good point. Um, Donna, can you you've described um, in Medellin there were preconditions that opened this up, which was the was the containment and the expulsion of the drug lords out of the city. Mm -hmm. um, the economy picked up drastically mm -hmm. at, at that time, mm -hmm. and this use of the word design isn't in the title of your course. Um, the title of your course is infrastructure, and I think it might be important to think of these insertions as infrastructure and less concerned about them as design. Well, because infrastructure yeah. implies yeah. agency, design is, you know, a subjective discussion. Well, I let Robert. Well, the word infrastructure has a technical connotation, and I tried to emphasize in the bridge. In the is that bridge a piece of infrastructure? Absolutely. It's a technical construction that uh, makes it possible to negotiate that to topographic landscape in a very physical, clear way. If you wanted to go from this neighborhood to that neighborhood before, you had to go down into the valley, across, and then back up, and you just don't do it. Um, now, you just it's a horizontal thing. So in its instrumental quality, it is absolutely clear and commonsensical that now they can shop at each other's stores, they can you know, challenge each other to a soccer game instead of shoot at each other. Um, all kinds of things are possible in the infrastructure sense. But in the larger design sense, it's not just technical infrastructure. It is simultaneously an instrument that allows people to connect physically, but also it is something they built together. So it's an instrument of social negotiation and connection. Uh, it's also uh, a metaphor and a constant reminder of uh, the possibilities that are created by these connections. So it's instrumental on a continuum from the most purely technical way to the most philosophical, profound, transformative, social, cultural way. So I, I would argue that it's the, the distinction between technical infrastructure and aesthetic design is not uh, hard and fast, that it's a, a spectrum and a continuum that's important to, to recognize so you don't miss the boat in terms of, oh, it's just technical infrastructure. It's not. It's, so in a way, I'm arguing in favor of what you're saying. Uh, that design is part of all infrastructure. And it's you know, I, I, I would argue that, uh, I, I would argue this, I would agree with you and suggest that the word design comes in as that, um, that extra good dumb luck that there are good designers designing better plazas mm -hmm. that are more appealing, but, mm -hmm. the, but it's the insertion and the act of mm -hmm. action an agency first, right. and then if the library is a beautiful piece of architecture right. and appealing, that's great. If it were still a library that was marginally designed okay, it would still have impact. I think so too, because I actually think the King of Spain library is filled with flaws uh, from an aesthetic point of view. I guess I'm using the word design in the way implied by that circle, Bruce Mao's circle, where it's the big circle. The design is not just aesthetics. And as soon as you that's get all, over... The, that, for me, makes me feel comfortable. Yeah, as soon as you get over this thing where design is simply is mere aesthetics, first I would argue that there's nothing mere about aesthetics. And I think most, mm -hmm. you know, co conscious of where I am in the context, it's not, there's no such thing as just aesthetics. It's aesthetics. It's the big thing. Mm -hmm. But design uh, encompasses the technical, the aesthetic, the social, the economic, it's design, it it's only qualifies as design to the extent that it integrates uh, in a holistic way. And that's the genius of design, and that's the promise of design in the 21st century, is that it is, an, it is a holistic uh, pursuit. That's why business schools have design studios now. They're using they're attracted to design studio pedagogy because it is holistic and naturally integrates the technical, the aesthetic, the social, the economic, everything. And it's a little embarrassing that those of us in design schools are struggling with even warming up to this approach when it's, you know, the rest of the world is ahead of us in a lot of ways on this. With dignity, yes. Sentence or 
membership has a lot to do with readiness afterwards if you feel accepted or not. And, and actually, that, that's beauty. And beauty that's imposed from above, uh, as in the modernist uh, housing, you know, is it takes away from the, the dignity of the people who are there. Whereas beauty that uh, is something that is, and this is again the question: to what extent in Medellin are these the products of uh, a top-down uh, process, uh, or were all of those collaborative design meetings with the community and the mm -hmm. neighborhoods? To what extent were those legitimate uh, uh, incubators of what we see? And uh, that's the big question that um, I'm so drawn to Medellin. Um, I, I think that uh, participation comes a lot through the doing, the process itself. Mm -hmm. And more about that, often it's those kind of contexts, it's not so much, you know, talking and reflecting and discovering, but actually yes. part of And talking can kill it. Yeah. And it can also kill any innovation or experimental yeah. stage because you always want to be in a compromise and it's not possible. Right. Designed by committee. Yeah. So I think the process, how the process is handled, the construction there. Yeah. And that can build a really community. Yeah, it's, I mean, participation is a really, in that sense, you can make your own class. Yeah. Yeah. In the, me, there's a lot to do with scale as well. Because I, I always ask Alejandro, so how do you do community participation when you have, in the, the PUI North, North Oriental is 20,000 residents. How, how ever do you do it? And I think there are different levels of participation. And he said something, you know, sometimes there are clear decisions to be made. I mean, we tried out the cable cars, and then there are kind of merely logic points we had to build the stations based on the topography and the people they want to reach. So, and um, it has also to do with the houses that were in, in dangerous conditions. So, at some point you go there as a planner and designer together with the infrastructural engineers and you devise a plan and then you try out if it could work with that, um, with that uh, community. Just going there without a plan would not have gotten yeah. them anywhere because the cable cars at the scale that affect so many people and you cannot be defined by somebody who happens to have his house on the spot where they build the station because they reach another 10,000 people with that station. So and then the other decisions like how to form out the streets and the plazas. There is a much more intimate level of community participation. So I think there's a lot to learn in, in that area. But one point you brought up, and this is for me the the most striking point of Medellin, you mentioned it too, and you questioned it to some degree, was the uh, role of beauty, of the role of iconography, and dignity. And maybe, we know some, you could say, from a very superficial point, again, Medellin is a case where just an architect tries to do a spectacular building in a very poor neighborhood. And become, you know, because of the contrast, the building stands out, and you are in the newspapers. And some people say that. And on the other hand, I think it really cuts us to a deeper level that you're also saying, and it might not be always exemplified the best, is in terms of what you said in your talk, that there is something that proves that is a, there's a will of the government to do something in your area that is, you, can, you will only find in the formal parts of the city. So what I mean that the government is saying, okay, we give you really nice elements that other people that have more money and live in the <coughs> Normal parts get on a daily basis. You might get even nicer things. And it might be a special reaction to a huge pressure of suffering, where the, there are the highest crime rates in the world, the people are dying daily, and um, when you have a city in that state, um, you might have to do extraordinary things to turn it around. And Medellin is, I mean, you could think a little bit more about iconography. The Spanish Library, I agree, in terms of a building, and compared with the other building that was much more perforated, mm -hmm. and where you said the inside and outside is almost indistinguishable, but the Spanish library for some reason is an emblem. It right. sits up there, mm -hmm. it's, it can be seen from many miles away, 
and uh, it was there in a, in a spot where it showed also to the people in the pharmacy, oh my God, what's happening up there? You know, if, if it's a very, if it's a building that blends into its neighborhood, um, the, it does not show to the world and to the rest of the city there's some change happening up there. So there is a lot of, I think, value in um, thinking about beauty, dignity, and iconography and when to use it, <coughs> and when it is used only to, let's say, you know, increase your own ego as a designer. Mm -hmm. That you say, okay, now I will be shown in front of this because I design this thing. Yeah, I, I was They don't really, they, at that point, they don't really know how the people will react with the bill. That, that maybe it's because of fashion clothes like all of the models. You, you do see a difference, you have all these metal bars, like, it's much more the clothes. And I, I was thinking, like, yeah, maybe they don't really know how the people will react. Like, this was a, a very violent moment. So. And actually, I, I think the bill has a lot of problems in terms of design. But, but yeah, as all the other library parts, it's surprising how there, there are really active public space for children computer labs. They have all these programs, and that's what the other thing I was to mention regarding the comment of uh, the uh, They have a big box of compensation, capital compensation from the year, like family compensation box, some, some kind of state. Agency came came about from another another earlier project, but it's basically the the agencies who run that library and are not running like it's sort of a mix between private, public, and the community. And that's when I was there. You know, I always feel like, what is the difference? What is happening here? It's like it's so different, <coughs> and it's because they the position to to all these uh, interventions are not like. A that was my main feeling. And having an interview with one person, I think we'll try to show the story later. Uh, they, they built this project uh, recuperar, like they recover one trash hill, one this icon of the trash we want to slam, and the city embrace the trash. Basically, <coughs> this is the trash of the whole city, it's not the trash of that piece. So through that and all the all the kind of pro programs, they start to collaborate, the state, the community, and the, the individual. So I think this triangulation, she was telling me, this triangulation and uh, building and several, like maybe 20 years of building trust between this triangulation, community, business people, and the government. Because in Latin America, nobody is trusting. So I, she told me, and I think that's pretty important, like this triangulation of trust in all these years make this, in a way, happen. Maybe the bill has iconic representation of all these problems. But I think there's an interesting comment here that, you know, this building comes out of, and I think it was the first library park, it's, it's a test. Yeah. It's still a test. And I've been in, there are similar efforts in Sao Paulo, for example, that have these schools that serve as community centers, they build them in the middle of favelas. And when you go there, they're surrounded by a big fence, and there are two guards with machine guns standing there, and small children in school uniform go there. And when you really want to visit them, you have to call ahead, and then you have to show your, your uh, ID, and then you're compromising there. So there are fortresses inside of an urban fabric. And I was surprised in meeting actually how open these schools were. Um, you know, if somebody wants to go in there and do damage, they can do that. And the Spanish Library was really probably the, was one of the first tests. I mean, it has this bar, I agree with you, at the entrance, at the entry level, it has these bars where you have to go through. Um, but general security is very relaxed. But the building could be made into a fortress pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And the subsequent buildings don't have that element anymore. It's, it's quite uh, astonishing. 
You mentioned it, but but isn't there a lot to be dwelled on with respect to the urban spaces that are created at these junctures of the cable car, yeah. the library? Those might be the most important sort of mediating spaces for sociability. That and this is what that Alejandro is saying. You know, um, saying, the building's great, but it's yeah. th th they're yeah. generous spaces. Yes. Exactly. But, yeah. but this, I think these are like the visual like items. But I mean, I, there are another items that you can build in. Not that fancy because there are not icons. I think it's difficult for me to mention that. They have this Cerezo in the center of the developed business development. Mm -hmm. So it's the same as public space, but for, like you say, economy is the main issue. Yeah. So they have a network of these Cerezo all over the place, but it's basically support small business in micro communities, in micro zones, so, uh, you know, different kinds of support, different kinds of business. And it's like a very important. And they build buildings too, small scale, not not icons. But I think these are another example of this defragmentation. It's an orchestration of many, many tools. Alejandro Echeverri he says basically that the most important inventions are invisible. And yes. he said, What yeah. do you mean by that? He said he's tired of seeing the Spanish Library in the magazine. <laughs> And he's saying actually the most effort we spent was into public space and social institutions and they re renovated 40 or 50 schools and you you know they did a lot of the on the inside and um, they um, made thousands of new streets and pathways <coughs> and stairs and small plazas and he says that was the first basis to bring democracy back into these areas the people could go out again um, and he's a little bit tired of seeing the but I think it has to be both. It's the orchestration that you have these emblems, these icons, and then you have the connection of streets. And if you would study the, the case of, of Caracas, um, yeah, there was also um, the cable cars built and the stations, but they don't have this network that goes deep into the neighborhoods where they have social improvements, physical improvements of streets. Um, as I understand, I have not been there, but you pretty much cannot leave the stations because you're afraid of your life. Yes, you that's true. Because uh, we did a comparative study between Caracas and Medellin, and that is uh, very much uh, what we came away from. It's interesting. It's very comparable because the Metro Cable, the, the cable cars, was an idea that first was broached in Caracas, but first implemented in Medellin. And now that Caracas has the Metro Cable in place, um, it is. Uh, very dangerous um, walking around the neighborhoods uh, in Caracas, you know. The, and just to reinforce what's been said, the Sodesco, the Sodesco, those these entrepreneurs stimulator programs, um, it kept coming up. And everyone we talked to, with Alejandro and, and our other informants, um, that's all people seem to be talking about. And the architects were like, well, who cares? That's just business development. And so that was our bias. It was like, ooh, library. And you know, children at laptops. Okay, that's good. But what's all this? Why do you keep harping on this business stimulation thing? Well, it turns out, um, despite our prejudices in favor of the physical fabric, this is the real transformative element uh, that the library parks are delivering. They are a vehicle for this social transformation. Uh, you can educate all of these uh, former drug warriors, but then what? So they'll be smarter about how they terrorize the community with their AK-47s. Uh, no, you have to give them more than an education. You have to give them uh, jobs and, a, and an opportunity. Uh, you can't just take away their gun. You have to give them an opportunity to substitute for it that is a better offer. Uh, and that's the real... Uh, that's the transformative element. It's not the beauty. Uh, that's just a vehicle for this transformative element. Yeah. No, I definitely felt like in the game there's this affirmation of the informal settlements as saying that they have the right to be there and they're intended. But I was wondering, like, um, what you were just saying about the <coughs> opportunity to people. And I was, um, <coughs> my area of research with Nate is about the informal commune. Mm -hmm. And my reading about the informal commune how just like these neighborhoods and housing provide resilient solutions, also the informal economy is more resilient, small scale in order to provide people, often the participants, 
provide them a better income than they would get with the, you know, what the government can provide them with jobs? Certainly. So I'm wondering about how <clears throat> the government's also working in relationship with these informal economy networks in, in the, like whether, let's say, is the labor force for making these community improvements brought, sourced from the, from the actual informal settlements? And whether you know anything about that? Well, I can enthusiastically uh, support those questions being asked because those are crucial questions. Um, the only thing I can really point out is that by making the trip uh, to the city a matter of you know 30 or 40 minutes, whereas before it was an hour or two or three to get there, it opens up uh, opportunities that otherwise were lost to the people, you know, and whether that opportunity is working in a bank or selling pens on a pedestrian overpass, uh, it's still access to economic opportunities that did not exist before simply by uh, unlocking uh, that obstacle of transportation and mobility. And this is kind of, again, in the past week, uh, two days ago, I think it was announced that Medellin uh, won a global uh, award for transportation. You know, forget about the library parks and all of that. Simply the transportation earned it um, an award and not from a technical infrastructure point of view alone. It was very much because of its social transformative impact of that technical uh, infrastructure of transportation. Independent of all the, the fancy pants architecture. Um, and the car sorry. was conceived before Fajardo came that was already an idea coming out of the And the place. subway, yeah. Because it takes a long time to, to develop the subway. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, I think, to your last comment also, you are creating a gap, because maybe you give access to some opportunities of job, but at the same time, all these projects of infrastructure and design, they will impact on the value of land. So, and there is also real estate in the informal settlement. So now the land value is gonna go up. So maybe you give access to <coughs> economic income, but how are going to people be able to pay like the new amount of, of money for their land? So mm -hmm. in the end, I, I, I'm very skeptical about the, the old project of Medin, if we look at it like from a larger point of view, on a larger scale. Because yeah. it seems to me that lots of problems have been pushed away. Or it just creates new problems. Yeah, and, and then I'm thinking mainly mm -hmm. about all the reconfiguration of drug dealing that is mm -hmm. now, you say, outside. So what about the people that were living there? You know, mm -hmm. now the situation for them is worse. Right. And then there is this issue of gentrification, and all the people of Medin are going to have to live and actually go in these places where it's worse, and mm -hmm. even it's like out of sight. Mm -hmm. So. Well, that, there are a couple of things about that. The cable cars, the, cars, the lower parts, the bottom parts, getting In a way, this is the starting point for the question of reflexivity. Here, you know, is this just another top-down whoosh, you know, urban renewal type strategy? And now let the new problems that in some ways might be even more severe than the old problems, now we have to deal with that. Uh, is that the situation? Or does, does the way these projects uh, were approached and implemented, does that open up uh, the mechanisms of governance and self-governance and uh, negotiation of, of between uh, suddenly empowered populations so that there is this triangular, the government can no longer just do whatever it wants, it has to negotiate between the business community and the, the, the residents who live there. Does that produce a more uh, reflexive uh, system that is capable of responding? Um, and uh, that's the research question. One of the things that has been narrowly averted is the Hernando de Soto uh, uh, mystery of capital, you know, extension of exchange value markets to all this land. So. As severe as the uh, now uh, inflated land values, as, in, as severe as that might be, and I'm, I don't want to downplay that, if it were uh, 
formal settlement, land owned, you know, with titles and uh, uh, with all of that uh, that that entails, there would be instead of just the utility value, the use value of the land, which has increased, there would be this um, multiple multiplier effect of the exchange value of uh, capitalist ex, uh, uh, speculation on top of it. The fact that land exchanges are still to a large extent uh, between community members that keeps a cap on that and that's going to be true for the most part as long as uh, it doesn't enter the formal land market mechanism that has arguably um, devastated our economy and society uh, the inflation uh, of speculation on land values um, and so it's it's a complex thing and you know is this architecture getting into you know capitalism versus you know exchange value versus use value well you know ask the question if you look at the place and how it operates and you ask why does it look that way why does it operate that way what is the best approach to design those questions are increasingly going to lead us to these questions of economic systems and social justice and we can have a choice to either turn a blind eye to those things and continue to miss opportunities or we can bravely go into the questions like land values uh, and try to figure it out no matter how much we hate I used to go down the aisles of the library when I was in architecture school and they'd go to you know the economics ha I don't have to know that go down you know geography social sciences all that. I don't need to know any of this and I go straight to the big picture books and I was like ah my nice <laughs> architecture yeah and now here I am back you know, use value just to figure out how this stuff works you got to get into it so those are great questions Well, the, the land rights, yes, okay. but not formal title. Okay. And this is where you get messy. You know, what's the difference? Right. You know, uh, from a North American perspective, until you got title, baby, yeah. you ain't got nothing. Right. But that's different here. You have land rights, uh, and you cannot. It, it's and it's on a again on a spectrum on a scale. And at one level of one end of the scale is out and out formal land title, uh, paying taxes, but. Uh, it's hard for uh, people who are only familiar with uh, Western Europe and North America to comprehend, but the rest of the world deals with multiple gradations of land rights, and that's only one of them. Um, yeah. Can I just add a point that there are perceptions of tenure security is not necessarily that uh, complete tenure security will lead to an improvement of investments and improved home improvement. For example, Peru is, I think, leading in giving out titles. Brazil, for example, invests more in doing these kinds of infrastructure projects and making much more uh, investments. And there was a significant shift in Brazil uh, with the uh, granting of significant land rights without title. Uh, they give leases, in, like in Sao Paulo, when they upgrade, you get a lease to your house, a nine-year lease, basically. So, and then you can pass it on to your children. And they avoid the issue of land rights by talking about the house. Quick technical question. Can, can maybe Alejandro might weigh in more easily, but how expensive are introducing these cable car systems? And technically, how off, how are they run, and how often do they run? Constant. They run. So are, are they so twenty four hours or you know, more or less? I think I don't so. Know if they run twenty four hours, but early to late. <clears throat> I mean, probably you can. I mean, these times are even posted on the internet, so you can. Yeah. I know that the one line they built was thirty million dollars. So um, that was the, the and it's one point five kilometers long. It has three or four stations. And more to come. Yeah. yeah. And then they built one more line. So it's and pretty cost effective, more. actually. It's not I mean, that expensive. No, it's really, it's yeah. really cost effective yeah. from a yeah. say a roadway yeah. cost infrastructure. Yeah. So it's 
mean, Rio de Janeiro is doing it now, so they are, I mean, this is a, it's a model that might work for other cities that have very hilly areas and are high, highly densely settled. Again, of course, it's not an enigma anymore. I mean, when they tried it out, they were not sure if it would work. When it was introduced in Rio, there were worries that uh, the gangs would shoot at the gondolas. That was the worry. He said, will never work. I, I talked to your planners there, who worked for 20 years there. said, will never work, they will shoot at the company. And that didn't happen so far. And that might have been true yeah. previously. Yeah. You use the same ticket of the train, so yeah. you just see it, it's like another line of the train. You use the same yeah. ticket, you see the line, it's like another station. And then with the train, maybe one dollar, maybe less. They were extended all the way to two Uri. It's like an ecological park. They extended four kilometers into a, a nature now reserve. You, now you take it, you can stop in this train, but you can go all the way to an ecological park. Which, which introduces a cultural amenity for the city, access for yeah. everybody to this. Yes. Um, I just have a question about um, maintenance. Because um, you know, at this point, everything, all these sort of um, infrastructures are quite new, and so they're all in pretty good shape. Um, so also, given that the population is expected to increase and the sort of informal settlement is expected to grow in the next 20 or 30 years, what are kind of some of the visions or plans in terms of maintaining these spaces and buildings and at the same time preparing for kind of an influx of more people? Good question for Alejandro. But um, my impression is to is that um, you know the, to the extent that people take pride in this, uh, it's less of an issue than it would otherwise be, uh, and uh, it's yeah. That's I guess that's all I can say. This, um, I see you are really researching your topics, and of course next week when Alejandro is here, that's part of that that you present what you found out. But then please also write down your questions. Because that was the idea that you, he's here, he can give you comments back, so this is a great question. I think the, um, and I will ask Alejandro about that too, uh, some refer to Medellin as anomaly, mm -hmm. that it was, a, it's a one-time occurrence, and you talked about the translational capacities of this model to other circumstances. And um, there might be, you never can do one-to-one -one translation, so that you have to study Medellin and then to understand which pieces could be translated to another case you will run into your practice in the next 20, 40 years. Um, but one of the same things that came together, of course, for Medellin was that there was this strong fight and national fight against um, organized crime. And um, at the same time, that it, Medellin had a strong economy and um, the economy there was also heavily influenced because no business people would like to come to Medellin anymore because it was so dangerous, that there was this strong will to change, not only from the resident side, but also from the economic side. And then as soon as there was a hopeful leader of the city, the claim was that then I would not steal anymore, so that means I will pay taxes now, that more uh, economic uh, Prices would pay taxes, so in the so there was a rising horizon for economic uh, uh, enterprise. There was a lowering of of organized crime, and then in that, and then there was a leader who had a, a social vision, and who could negotiate with all these different partners, with the architects, with the business people, with the uh, military and the police, and I don't know what kind of back deals are. I mean, there's a there, there's some. When you talk to some um, people in Medellin, some of them have the opinion that there's still the same amount of drugs flowing through the city than before. It's just more covert. And it's not like that Pablo Escobar bombs people in the street. It's just more underground. I don't know what you think. But so there are, I mean, there are rumors. Um, but again, it happened in a certain um, point of time with certain uh, developments happening. So when you all when you run into other you know models that you study Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, always look at the whole context. 
economic context and political context that I can still understand those. You might also want to ask about um, there's been some indications of slippage, for example, that things are not going as planned and things are not getting better. There's actually a little bit of slippage, a little bit more crime, and so you know, it's not a done deal. Uh, this could go either way, still. Well, this is the key question. My research uh, began in Indonesia, uh, in informal settlements there, where I lived in an informal settlement. And it's crystal clear um, that the biggest single factor are the strength of the local social organizations. Uh, in Java, there are uh, such powerful block and neighborhood associations. They were set up uh, during the Japanese colonial period to control top-down the neighborhoods, but in the post-independence period that got turned around to some extent, there was still a military dictator. But especially recently, these things, these, the heads of these organizations are elected uh, from the, the people at the most grassroots way, you know, 17 households in a block. They elect a leader, and then the block associate, the neighborhood association, they elect a leader, there's such a fine-grained, uh, very highly accountable local, very strong, and uh, you don't go against your neighbors. In a way, it's very tyrannical. But at the same time, there's a great deal of political power that emerges from a bottom-up way. And this is the key to physical transformation of uh, these urban settlements in uh, Southeast Asia, to a large extent. Um, I, my research in Caracas and Medellin suggests we don't have that. And so the potential for doing things is very different than in Southeast Asia. Even though the housing, I felt like I was home when I walked through the neighborhoods in Caracas. Um, you know, like I was back in Java, uh, but uh, it was extremely dangerous. Uh, and nothing is safer than these informal settlements in Java. So. Looks can be deceiving, and these social organizations that you're asking about are absolutely key to what the reality is and what the possibility is. It's, it's a, it's, I learned it has a, it's a big effect if there's organized crime. Mm -hmm. and in, in Avela, Bairro, and Rio, they were always trying to have their improvement projects together with the residents associations. But sometimes when there was most of the favelas, the organized crime was basically ruling it with sheer force. And the residents of social leaders were basically cronies of the drug lords. And at the end, who were, and there was a lot of criticism of a flawed participation process because you would sit with the leaders on a table, you would agree where a, a certain improvement is made or not. And you know exactly they are steered by the drug lord, they're not steered by the they are, they say things because of the drug that wants it a certain way. So as soon as you have, you know, the power through violence, then a participation, participation process becomes incredibly hard. The, as I understand, there was in Medellin when there were earlier phases of, of this one in the 90s called Pre-Med, there were residence organizations that, uh, the government tried to work with. There was less funding to do things, less will of, of the mayors, and then also the, the stronghold of the organized crime was so strong in this neighborhood. It was really hard to do a participatory community yeah. process. But the one thing worse than organized crime is disorganized crime. Because yeah. at least the, the, there are alignments of, of self-interest between the democratic institutions and organized crime. And I think that might be what part of what we're seeing in Medellin, if it's true that the drugs are still flowing, 
it's because there is an alignment of interests uh, that uh, I can't get straight answers so far about and when I look into that. One last question, and then we have. Okay. Um, I guess I kind of just wanted to comment on this rhetoric that, that design doesn't matter, um, because to me, uh, I mean, we can look at these buildings and compare them with, you know, very modernist forms, or, um, but to me, they're they're very different from a lot of modernist architecture. That they really are engaging and informed by their site and their context. And that's something that I think modernism really lacked. And we look at you know other public housing projects and, and all these other examples that fail. And, and really, maybe that's a critical issue for the reason that, that they weren't successful. Um, and I think that you know maybe you really have to appropriate those uh, considerations of site and context as perhaps the most critical part of design in order for them to be effective in other places. Um, I mean, if, if you go to another context and, and say, uh, look, Medellin uh, you know, built these cable cars in this library, and we need cable cars in libraries, um, but you never let that be informed by the locale. I, I think you'll never see that. And I, I think what happened in Medellin is that there's kind of a breakdown of those typical you know, uh, bureaucratic limitations that would say that that would determine you know how something would be built and, and what um, influences would would control the design of it and, and uh, so it was opened up. So you're saying? Well, yeah, I, yeah. the um, I wouldn't say that design doesn't matter. I wouldn't say that design is all that matters. I would say design helps. And I would also say that sometimes design can make all the difference in the world, but still, in and of itself, it would not result in anything positive. Um, the, as a matter of fact, when design is executed for the sake of design, it can be more harmful than helpful. Well, in that it displaces uh, other considerations such as dignity of the people uh, and their ownership, their sense of ownership. And that's when you get organ rejection, you know, where something beautiful gets placed into a context, and no matter how beautiful it is, it gets rejected because it's alien. The DNA is just, you know, uh, it's not about how beautiful it is, it's about, um, it's an alien imposition. Imp um, so it's a more complex relationship um, than it's all about design or design doesn't matter. It's design can, I would finish with, design can make all the difference in the world. Uh, but in and of itself is, is almost never enough. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you for having me.